been sitting here waiting so patiently for me to come in. And um, for those who are watching online, you're not seeing anything right now because for some reason we just lost our internet connection in there. So they'll get it later. But welcome. Glad to see all of you here tonight for this Wednesday evening service. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day and we thank you for this church, for this family that you've given us, this community in which we live together as your children, this community in which we share life together. What a blessing it is. We pray, Lord, that as your presence is already here in this place tonight, as your presence is already among us, that you will make us aware of that presence, that you'll fill our hearts with your love and fill our hearts with joy because we can know that we belong to you in Christ's name. Amen. Do we have any celebrations anyone would like to share this evening? Any joys? Donna? Um, I know I talked to you previously about Noelle having shingles. And she is shingle free. Medicine worked very quickly. And um, so thank you, Lord. <laughs> so we're just hoping she'll stay on track now and get recovered from it all. All right, wonderful. So a praise that Noelle is shingle free. Others? My God, the Lord. Tom Jones had a very good report for the doctor. Yeah. He's cancer free. All right, so Tom Jones is cancer free. All right. Any others? All right, well, let's listen to God's word for this evening. I've got two passages that we're going to read this evening. I invite you to stand if you're able. Our first reading comes from the very opening verses of the scriptures, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Our second reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, beginning with verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not fail or be discouraged till he hath established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. In response to this hearing of God's word, let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of the sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. And let us pray. Lord, you have spoken to us through your word as it is read aloud. 
And I pray now you will continue to speak through your servant. Help me to proclaim the truths you want your people to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. The first act of creation in the book of Genesis was God created light. He spoke, he said, let there be light, and there was light, and he separated the light from the darkness. And if you've ever been in a very dark room, as some of us were probably expecting to be last night around 10 o'clock, um, our, our power flickered quite a few times. We figured we were going to lose it, but fortunately we didn't. But you know that a flashlight or a candle or a cell phone or any source of light can cut through that darkness. And um, John's Gospel, where we talk about, uh, where John talks about Jesus and begins his Gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So that means that in the beginning when God said, let there be light, Jesus was there. Jesus was involved in that creation. John goes on to say, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcoming. So like a candle or a flashlight cuts through physical darkness, Jesus Christ cuts through the spiritual darkness of sin. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's like when God first created everything, what he wanted to do was overcome the darkness. When Christ came into the world, what was God doing? Overcoming the darkness once again. And there are two realms in which we as human beings can choose to live. We can live in a realm of light or we can live in a realm of darkness. The light that's living in God's kingdom. Darkness is remaining in our sin, choosing to live apart from God. And God sent his son Jesus to shed light in the darkness so that we can see and understand God's will for our lives. When you think about different let there be light moments, certainly there's creation. Let there be light and there was light. We can also look at Jesus' birth as a time when God said, let there be light. Because John says the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And then in the second chapter of Luke, when Simeon uh, sees Jesus, when Jesus is presented in the temple, he says, um, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So again, we see Jesus referred to as a light coming into the world. And then there's yet another moment in our lives when God says, let there be light. And that's the moment that we are reborn through Christ. Then we receive that light within our own lives. And that light helps us to see what we can't see in the darkness. What, what's, what is it that we can't see when we're in the dark? We can't see our sin. We can't see our shortcomings. We can't see what's wrong with our lives. We can't see a need for forgiveness. We can't see what God's love is all about. We can't see what it is to truly love another person because we're too hung up on what it is that we want and what we need. So in that moment, like when John Wesley said, I felt my heart strangely warm, what happened for John Wesley was the light came on. And it wasn't that he figured it out. It was the Spirit had been trying to reveal something to him for some time. And finally, he saw it. 
and the light came on. It's like a whole new life opened up for him at that point. This Sunday, we're going to be looking at the baptism of Jesus as it's recorded in Mark's gospel. And we are going to do a baptismal remembrance this Sunday because baptism is important. And um, the Sunday when you celebrate the baptism of Jesus was actually last Sunday. But because of how the calendar worked with Epiphany and everything, and I know everybody wants to sing We Three Kings. So we do. So we did Epiphany last Sunday. We'll do Baptism of Christ this Sunday. Then we'll get back on the calendar. But we remember in his baptism something pretty momentous happened. The Spirit descended like a dove, and a voice came out from the sky that said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. When we accept Christ's forgiveness, that same thing basically happens for us. The spirit comes down and God claims us as his own. God declares, this is my beloved child with whom I'm well pleased. And what happens for us is heaven, which was closed to us, is now open to us. Jesus' baptism displayed a connection between heaven and earth. Jesus was already God's son. But at his baptism, that connection, that relationship was made known. That relationship was publicly Declared, If you will, you could say it was made official at that point. When our baptism, when we are baptized, we have, um, we've already become a child of God. We've, if, say as an adult, you make a decision, I want to follow Jesus, I want to be baptized. You've made that decision. And baptism is when it becomes official. It's kind of like signing the adoption papers. Um, you officially become a part of the family. You officially become a part of the church. And it's not the waters of the baptism that change the person. It's not the words of the pastor that changes the person. It's the Holy Spirit that changes a person. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit cannot move into someone's life if there's no room in their life. If we have too many other things in our life to crowd out the Holy Spirit, there's no room for the Holy Spirit. But we say that when a person is baptized, God claims them as his child. How many of you have been baptized? Everybody in here has been baptized. So we have been declared a child of God in the church. The Holy Spirit has come down and stamped on us, child of God, right across our forehead, permanent ink. Nobody can scrub it off. We can still get lost, but it still says God's child on there. What does it mean to be a child of God? How do we live like children of God? Well, let's look at someone that was God's child, that is Jesus. What did Jesus do with his life? He healed the sick. He shared the good news. He brought sight to the blind. He was kind to people. He loved people. He was compassionate to the outsiders. He lifted up the little people. He cared about those who were on the fringes of society, the outcasts. And he dedicated his entire life to teaching about God's love. And he dedicated his life so strongly to that that when it came time, he laid his life down to teach about God's love, right? So that's what he did. That's what a child of God does. So why did God send his son to do all those things? Because God's will is for everybody to come to know him as God. God does not want 
to punish sinners. He wants to welcome sinners home. Now, I didn't say that God won't punish sinners. I said he doesn't want to punish sinners. He wants all lost sinners to come home. He wants us to be released from whatever it is that is holding us back from being all he created us to be. Think about the Israelites when they were in Egypt. Were they being all that God created them to be? No, they couldn't. So what did God do? He released them. He led them out of captivity. He led them to a new life where he wanted them to be. We are held back by our sin. Our sin is like the enslavement that held the Israelites in Egypt. God's will is for us to be freed from that enslavement and to be free to live our life in harmony with him and with each other, because that's the way he meant for it to be. In the reading from Isaiah tonight, Isaiah speaks about a servant who's going to bring forth justice. That was the light that came into the world. That was the servant to bring forth justice. And when we talk about justice, and we've talked about this before, there's a difference between God's justice and the world's justice. We want life to be fair. It's not, is it? Life is not always fair. The world is not fair. The world is not just, but God is just. And the servant, who is Jesus, is going to come to help bring the world to understand what God's justice is? And what if I said God's justice is? People taking care of each other. People putting others' needs ahead of their own. That's God's view of justice. Everybody living together in harmony. Nobody being in want. Nobody being without. Nobody. And, and I'm, not, I'm not preaching socialism here. I'm not preaching that at all. I'm saying that if somebody's hungry and somebody else has food, that person with the food shares with the person who's hungry. We don't want to see anybody suffering. And we're willing to give to help someone else. That's what God's justice is. God's justice is a world where every single person matters. Where every single person matters to every other person where nobody is going to be cast aside or forgotten or swept under the rug because they're poor, because of the color of their skin, because of their level of education, because of some disability they have, because of their age. Every single person is important to God. And if Jesus is God's son and Jesus is God, then that means every single person is important to Jesus. And if we are to be like Jesus, then every single person should be important to who? To us. <clears throat> Isaiah says, A bruised reed this servant will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench. What he's saying is this servant is going to bring change, but he's going to do it through love and not through force. <clears throat> You know, Jesus doesn't look at us and say, you better follow God. Instead, he invites us to come. He invites us to fall. Jesus never did anything to draw attention to himself. He didn't do anything to condemn anybody else. He didn't bully anybody. He didn't beat people over the head with his teachings. Instead, he came to serve those in need. Isaiah said that a servant would come whom, in whom God would delight. Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus is the light given to the nations. God's Son does what Isaiah writes about. 
because of who he is. And if we are children of God, shouldn't we be servants as well? Shouldn't we be like Jesus? If I am a child of God, how did I become a child of God? Through adoption. God claimed me as his. And as I become a child of God, then I become like Jesus and I become a light to the nations. Thus, I have a responsibility to bring light to those who are in darkness. But let's not look at it as a responsibility because then it's like, well, we have to do this. We better do this. Instead, we should look at it as a privilege. It's a privilege to bring light to those in darkness. You look at the world today, there's a lot of darkness in the world right now. In Isaiah 59, I'm gonna read this to you. And this, remember, Isaiah was written a long time ago, and he was written about the circumstances in which uh, the people of God were at that time. He writes this in chapter 59. So justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. We look for brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. It sounds a whole lot like our world right now. There's so many in this world who were just groping around in the darkness like they're blind. They don't even know what God's justice is. They don't know what it is to be loved just for who they are. The world needs to know this. The world needs to know about God's justice. And we are the light that can lead others to find that justice. So when I say we are the light, does that mean that we are Jesus? No. But if Jesus is living in us, then his light is shining through us. When you go outside, one of the things I like about winter is that when it's clear on a winter night, it's really, really clear. And you can see a lot of stars. And when you look up, the next time you look up on a clear night and you see all those stars, think about that as being what our world looks like. There's all this darkness and scattered across it are these tiny little points of light breaking up the darkness. And I remember one time I was at the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And we were in a very remote place and it was a very, very clear and very cold night. And I looked up and there were so many stars that it almost looked like there was more white in the sky than there was black. And it was just amazing. And when you look up in the sky, you know, you see the most stars when there's the least light pollution coming from the earth, right? So think about all of the false light pollution that comes from all the things of this world and how that tends to blind people to those points of light who are the Christians all around the world trying to share the gospel. We are the light in the darkness. We too are servants who are called, who are privileged to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. And Isaiah said that the servant would not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. He's saying the world is hungry to hear what the servant has to share from where we are all the way to the ends of the earth, which would be the coastland for them, all the way to the ends of the earth, people are hungry to hear. And Jesus never gave up, did he? We can't either. 
we might say, oh, it's too hard, or it's too much work. Or, how, or, or tonight, we've got two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've got 11 people in here. We don't even have as many people in this room as there were disciples. Jesus started out with more than we've got in this room tonight. And we might say, what difference can we make in this world? If we think about it that way, we may get discouraged. We may give up. And when we give up, we turn our back on those who are hungering in the darkness. We're letting those who are oppressed just stay the way they are. Those who are helpless may not ever get any help if we don't do something. Darkness covers our world. And God says, let there be light. Creation was a let there be light moment for the world. The birth of Jesus was another let there be light moment. You know that every word that comes out of your mouth can be a let there be light moment for somebody. Every act of your hands can become a let there be light moment. We had a crew that came in here, I guess it was yesterday, Bill, and they packed up backpacks. You know that when some child opens up that backpack and sees all that food, there's light that shines out of that bag. They may not see it. They may not recognize it, but that light is there. And we are called to share that light in every way in every opportunity that we can. I offer you these truths in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Let's take a moment now to share prayer needs. Um, I talked to Shannon this afternoon, and Victoria will be having surgery on Monday to put in the plate and some screws and other things. Um, so we want to keep her in prayer. Uh, what about some others? Al Gray's brother. Al Gray's brother. Al Gray's brother. Okay. Mary Ann Fleming. Mary Ann Fleming. My sister Carol. She's she's sick. Your sister Carol. Your friend Rick having back surgery tomorrow. Okay. The world situation. The world situation. And a name for this baby. And a name for the baby. They don't have a name yet? It's <laughs> gone through every name in the book. They, they reject the whole of them. Now, help me remember, is it a little boy? Oh boy. Well, what's wrong with Jack? <laughs> <laughs> they should name him Jack. Uh, and then everything will be great. And our new secretary, as she settles in. All right. Prayers for our new secretary as she settles in. Thank you. And one more. Ali's uncle's funeral is Saturday morning in Maryland. And uh, this prayer is for, for that family. Right. And we're going to be traveling up there, traveling over six miles as we go up there. Okay, just, just for these uncle's family, uncle's funeral is going to be sad. Yeah. Okay. The family of Jeanette Linebarger is here this Friday. The family of? Jeanette Linebarger. Jeanette Linebarger. Yeah, okay. she's a lady I went to school with, special needs lady. Been went to law school with me. Okay. How about the 11 disciples in this room? <laughs> the 11 disciples in this room. As I recall, we had 12, but only 11 did the work. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Bill, that's going to make whoever didn't come tonight feel bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, 12 and 13 are out doing ministry right now. That's 15 hours. Yeah. 
What's that now? I said 12 and 13 are doing ministry right now. That's Nikki and Howard. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's, let's carry these needs to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, it's good to be together and to be able to pray together and to share with one another these needs that we're aware of. And we know, Lord, that there's so many more people that are hurting right now, people who are facing challenges, people who are struggling, people who find themselves in the dark. And we pray, Lord, for your light to shine upon them. We pray for your healing to come upon them. And we pray, Lord, that you help us as your disciples to bring light into their world so that they can see that because you are who you are, there is always hope. We pray this in Christ's name. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now I invite you as you're able to stand and share the peace of Christ. Oh, 
As I said earlier, Jesus does not tell us what to do. Jesus invites us. Jesus does not work through coercion. Jesus works through invitation. And he has given his body and his blood for us, and he invites you to come to his table and experience his grace for yourself.
one God, we give thanks for this holy ministry in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.